President and Chief Executive Officer, and he is here by video conference. And we also have Robert Malcolmson, Executive Vice President, Chief Legal and Regulatory Officer, who is also here by video conference. The rules are basically that you will, you have five minutes, Mr. Bibish, to make your opening statement. And then we will be followed up by questions and answers from the floor. And so I will give you a 30-second shout-out with your five, when you're five minutes so that you can have 30 seconds to wrap up. Remember, even if you cannot make your full statement in that five minutes, you're going to be able to expand on your statements when the question and answer period comes. So I shall begin. Uh, Madam Mr. Chair, I just have a point of order. Yes, sorry. Yes, Ms. Thank Thomas. you, sir. Just very quickly before we jump in, I just want to confirm, um, Ms. Catherine Tate has been asked to come to this committee and testify. Uh, she's been putting us off for a little while now. I'm just curious, is there a confirmed date yes. as to when Ms. Tate will be appearing here? Yes, I think there is. Ms. The clerk will tell us. Uh, May 7th. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, Mr. Bibich, Mr. Bibich uh, for five minutes, please, begin. Merci, Présidente et membres. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. A month prior to the committee rescheduling our meeting, so I'm glad we're having this important conversation today. Since Bell acquired CTV in 2011, the global media industry has drastically changed. The industry is in flux due to technological disruption, changing viewer habits, shifting advertiser demand, and vigorous competition from foreign web giants who are not subject to the same costly regulations as Canadian broadcasters. Half of all households will not subscribe to traditional TV in 2026. Meanwhile, streaming revenues already in the billions rose 14% last year and will increase by an additional $500 million this year, disproportionately benefiting foreign web giants. Audiences now expect around-the-clock access to news, and media companies have had to adjust. Some have sought to distort the facts about Bell's restructuring, and we should all agree that facts matter, so here are some important facts. One, Bell continues to invest in news and media. Since I became CEO in 2020, Bell invested, Bell Media has invested more than $1 billion in capital to better serve our viewers, not to mention the additional $22 billion invested in world-leading wireless and fiber internet networks, among other customer enhancements. And this is on top of the almost $1.7 billion a year we invest in content. Yet despite these massive investments, CTV conventional stations lost more than $180 million last year, and Bell Media loses more than $40 million a year on news alone. Two, Bell Media far exceeds all its regulatory obligations for local news. We air more than 25,000 hours of local news per year. That's 150% more than the CRTC requires. Three, CTV News Channel, CP24, and BNN air 20,000 hours of news per year. That's 300% more than the CRTC requires. Four, CTV publishes approximately three times more digital news stories on an average day than when Bell Media acquired, when Bell, when, than when Bell acquired it 13 years ago. Five, CTV now airs more original national newscasts than at any point in the network's 60-plus year history. Six, for the first time ever, CTV National News will soon have dedicated journalists telling stories from all 10 provinces and 35% more correspondence than prior to 2023. Seven, Seven we are investing more than ever in francophone content. In 2021, we launched Nouveau Info. Think about this. During a challenging time, Bell Media built a newsroom from the ground up. We hired a team of francophone journalists to broadcast news in five markets across Quebec. Since then, the newsroom has grown 25%. Eight, our Crave streaming platform offers almost 11,000 hours of French language content. And our Rouge FM program, Véronique et les Fantastiques, recently announced that it would play only French language music in its coveted time slot. No other Canadian media company has made investments of this scale, but it is not enough to overcome the challenges facing our industry. Bell made the difficult decision to implement workforce reductions through departures and the elimination of vacant positions. Less than 10 percent, or 440 positions, were at Bell Media. We know this is difficult for those affected, and we're supporting them with a fair severance package, career transition services, and continued access to health benefits. And we've met all obligations under collective bargaining agreements. Now, Bell is not alone. In the past year, 
The CBC announced that it will cut 800 positions. TVA has eliminated close to 550, and Chorus has reduced its workforce by at least 15%. Last year, TELUS announced 6,000 job reductions, and Rogers has also restructured. The list is long. Shopify, Canada, Goose, Lightspeed, Postmedia, Metroland, and Saltwire. Paramount, Disney, Microsoft, Apple, Meta, and others in the U.S. And now let me be clear, we're not asking for special protections. We're asking for a level playing field with global media web giants. Yet the regulatory framework has been too slow to adjust to the massive challenges we're seeing. The Online Streaming Act took three years to develop and it is still not implemented. Bell pays almost $2 billion a year in federal regulatory fees and contributions. In contrast, Amazon, Disney, Netflix, and others, each many, many times larger than Bell, have not paid anything. This despite the billions of dollars in revenue they earn from Canadians. I hope to use our two hours together to, destruct, to discuss constructive solutions so that future generations have access to stories that reflect them and our country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibbage, right on time. And um, now, I just wanted to remind everyone, before we go to the question and answer segment, that you are to address your questions and your answers through the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, so we begin now with, for the Conservatives for six minutes. This is a six-minute section. It's six minutes for question and answer, not six minutes for each. So please remember that and try to be as concise as you can in your answers. So for the Conservatives, Rachel Thomas, six minutes, please, Rachel. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bibbick, uh, Bell has received a pile of money from the government through enhanced media funds, uh, spectrum subsidies, COVID paychecks, um, and then various tax credits, of course, that have been added to that as well. I'm just wondering what that exact dollar figure is since 2015. Uh, I wouldn't have that exact figure since 2015 at my uh, you know, immediate disposal. Would you be able to tell us in the last five years? Couldn't tell you that either for the last five years. What about in the last year? Um, well, which components? So there would have been no wage subsidy dollars in the last year because we're well past COVID. Um, Canada Media Fund, I don't know, Robert, if you have uh, that information. I, I don't have that at my fingertips, but we can certainly provide it to the committee if you wish. We would appreciate that. Send it to the clerk and we distribute it. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Thomas. That would be great. Just to clarify, so I'm, I'm asking for the total dollar amount that's been received from the federal government of Canada since 2015 and that that be tabled with the committee. Um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just highlight a few that I found. Um, not everything is disclosed online, but I, I did discover through uh, poring over documents that Bell has received over $260 million in spectrum projects, um, $122 million in pandemic subsidies, even though you performed actually at your best during that time. Um, and then a healthy portion of the $600 million media bailout. So there's hundreds of millions of dollars that has been given to Bell. And yet here we are discussing the, the cutting of 6,100 jobs between June 2023 and February 2024. I, I find that rather rich. Now, tell me, how much is Bell Media worth? Oh, there's no current valuation of Bell Media as a separate entity within the uh, the, the the BCE um, within Thank all you. of BCE I, now. In terms of, let me I'd like sorry, to address Bivik. some of these issues. Just, in terms of, I'll just clarify. Well, Mr. I'd like Bivik. to I'd Mr. like Bivik, to I'll clarify. Just clarify. Can you please uh, order. I wasn't. Uh, you want asking, to clarify your question, Thank you, yes. Ms. Thomas? I'll just clarify. I wasn't asking about Bell Media. I was just asking about Bell. How much is Bell worth? Oh, we could look at we could look at the market cap of Bell today. If you're asking about the market cap. Of Bell today. We're sure while we talk, Robert can can dig that up in ten seconds. I, I'm sure he can. I'm sure he has it right now. Yeah. yeah. What is? But that's a function. Of, that's a function of a share, the share price at any given minute. So the the market cap of market capitalization of Bell is different now than it was an hour ago. Okay. Mr. Do you do you do you, do you think that it's in the range of like ten billion? Well, the market capitalization is significantly higher than that, but again, it's it's decreased significantly, you, unfortunately, in the billion? last couple of months, given the share price. Twenty well, billion. I'd rather have the number. I'm just curious. Maybe you can just tell me if I'm getting warmer. Twenty billion. 
sorry, I was having trouble with my microphone. The current the current yeah, market you're... cap of the current market cap of Bell is about forty million forty billion dollars. Thank you so much. Uh, so so Bell uh, has a, a worth of about forty billion with a B, forty billion dollars. Um, this is a company that is worth $40 billion, has received hundreds of millions of dollars in government handouts, which, let's be reminded, are taxpayer dollars. And yet, this is a company that just laid off 6,100 of those taxpayers. Is that justified? Okay, may I, I, now, I, may I, I now answer all these, these questions? There were several there. So having there's having just Canadian one. companies, there's, Mr. Bivik, there's just one well, question. Well, having having Look, strong Canadian question. companies there's just one is question. a very Mr. is a Bivik, fundamentally please, good thing. I think Ms. Thomas is trying to clarify the question. Thank you. Well, Chair, if there was, Ma I've not there yet was, had an opportunity was, to, to I've not yet had an opportunity to even ha provide one sentence of an answer. Asking so I'd just like just an opportunity to comment. Question, she said, and not three. Mr. Thank Vivek, you. you're right. You, you actually have answered with a few sentences. You said, I don't know, about five different times, maybe six different times. So I'm hoping perhaps you'll know the answer to this question, and that is, is it justified that you just laid off 6,100 employees in the last eight months when you have received hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government, and it is a company worth $40 billion. I would think that we'd want strong Canadian companies that can continue to employ tens of thousands of Canadians. We employ 40,000 Canadians with good paying jobs. Uh, we are right now faced with an economy where we have um, difficult foreign exchange with the U.S. Most of our inputs are in U.S. dollars. The costs of inputs are increasing. Inflation is rampant in Canada. Unemployment's at 6.1 percent in March alone. Mr. Bibic, our I'm, content costs I'm for go to my next are increasing. I, I we have a massive. I don't know that you have an answer. We have a massive me. productivity issue in Canada. So these are the macroeconomic factors that. All Canadian companies, including Bell, are dealing with, and we're trying to adapt and adjust so that we can continue to grow, which is a good thing, okay. and that we can continue to hire and retain Thank and you, employ 40,000 Canadian Thank companies. You, Mr. Bivik. That's seconds. a very good thing. Mr. Bivik, I'll just take a, a moment here just to remind you about this committee. Um, as a member of parliament, a duly elected member of parliament, I sit here at this table able to ask any question that I wish. Um, and, and your job is to answer those questions not in a way that you wish to answer or to make the spiel that you wish to, to put out there, but rather in a factual manner. And if you fail to do so, we have every ability to bring you back in a summons. Chair, I fully respect um, the committee's work and my role in answering the questions of the committee. In fact, I, um, I welcome public policy discussions and over my 20-year career in this industry, I've appeared before many committees and regulatory proceedings and industry roundtables, and I will always treat this uh, committee and the process with the utmost respect. That's uh, a fundamental part of what my, uh, my career has been about. We are now uh, ended the six-minute question and answer time. To Mr. New Mohammed Talib, you have six minutes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Bivich, for being here. Um, today's conversation uh, is a direct result of a decision uh, that Bell made in eliminating jobs after, as you've heard from uh, Ms. Thomas, receiving large government subsidies. In particular, um, you received uh, a break on approximately $40, billion, uh, $40 million, excuse me, in fees as a result of an amendment passed by uh, the Conservatives and the NDP. Your response to that was to fire Canadians, to let them go from their jobs. Um, Mr. Bibich, was not um, the board's uh, response to your work in 2023 to a strategic impar uh, imperative to, quote, engage and invest in our people and create a sustainable future. If your mandate from your board was to invest in your people, can you explain to me how cutting 6,300 jobs is investing in your people? Well, in fact, if you, you know, take 
to 6,300, about 500 or 550 of that total number was in uh, in media. And the uh, the Part Two fees issue that you raise in the opening of your question relates to media, not to the broader, not to the broader bell. And we have invested in the broadcasting industry, and we have invested in our people. I mentioned in my opening statement investments of 22 billion dollars in since I became CEO in world leading networks, and the fact that we've built so many uh, so much fiber internet to so many homes has allowed us to hire more field technicians. So we've grown let's, the unionized let's, let's, workforce of field Divich, technicians by 14 percent, which Mr. is a big, big number. Mr. And those Divich, are high-paying union jobs. Mr. Bivich, if they're high-paying union jobs, then I wonder why Unifor is so concerned, because they've written to every member of this committee expressing their disappointment in your decision. Uh, Mr. Bivich, okay, I'd like I, to talk if, a little if bit I, if about... I may, uh, that wasn't a that question. One. That wasn't a Sorry, question, Mr. Mr. Bivich. Uh, Mr. Mo New Mohammed has the floor. Uh, okay. Mr. Bivich, in... Uh, According to according to your own corporate filings, your um, your compensation package last year was approximately thirteen million dollars. Is that correct? That is correct, and, and I would clarify that according to Unifor, we hire we, re, we employ nineteen thousand. Mr. Bivich, my question members, was about your compensation package, number. and you've answered that in fact it was approximately um, thirteen million dollars. That's, that's correct. What does the average journalist working in your newsrooms earn? Well, I wouldn't have that it's precise number at my fingertips. Do you think it's more or less than a hundred? I, I will. I actually wouldn't know. So you talk about making investments in news. You talk about the importance of a news ecosystem in this country, but you don't know how much your journalists make. Um, I, I do know that we spend almost $300 million a year in news uh, in this country at Bell Media alone. Well, you spend That's a lot of investment. That, that is a lot of, I mean, that is a lot of investment. But, you know, when you talk investing yeah. in people, clearly Bell has invested well in you. Um, my, my question to you, Mr. Bibich, is when you look at your opportunity to act as a leader. Did you ever consider foregoing your bonuses, your equity package, or some portion of your salary to save some of the important jobs, particularly of journalists in this country? Well, the, you know, the, so as it comes to reduction, so first I would say we've grown news correspondence by 35%. In my, you know, since prior to 2023, and we started a newsroom in the French language in the province of Quebec from scratch in 2021. No one has done this. I can't think of anyone in North America. Should I take that as a the no? the world that has done this. I'll take that as a no. Well, um, no. In terms of that direct, the direct question, we've actually. Uh, implemented reductions uh, across the entire company. So our vice presidents and, and higher are, there's 23% Mr. Bivich, fewer vice presidents at Bell since I became CEO and 40% fewer Mr. Bivich, fewer my, question, my question is a specific one. Did you, and now I will expand, did you or any of your executives choose or consider foregoing your bonuses to save the jobs of average Canadians who are working in your newsrooms and in other parts of your organization? It's simple yes or no. And if the answer is what no, we did, that's okay. No, what we did is we re dramatically reduced the executive ranks so that we could retain as many jobs across the company as possible. That's what we did. So I'd like to talk a little bit about news. Because one of the things that we have a dearth of in this country is the ability for small communities, rural communities, indigenous communities to have their stories told. How do you expect journalists to maintain the quality of local news from local communities if they're sitting in newsrooms in Toronto and not in the field. And when you eliminate jobs across this country, particularly of journalists in small communities, how do you expect those communities' voices to be heard? Uh, thank you for the question. It's a, it's a very good question. Now, the, I would say that, again, the question, the question doesn't acknowledge the facts that I've shared with you today, that we have 35% more news correspondents today than in 2023. So we are investing in news. It doesn't. The question doesn't recognize that we're, we've built a newsroom in Quebec from the ground up from scratch. It doesn't recognize the other fact that I shared with the committee this morning that we now, which for the first time in CTV's history, have journalists in every single province. That's that's a first. So that's how we're covering news locally and nationally and serving our viewers. Because number one is our viewers. They, they want to have more news. 22 Mr. seconds. Mr. Vivich, uh, I will say this. As somebody who used to watch W5, I'm really disappointed that my views were not considered when you cut that program. You know, 
I, I would say this. I, I come to politics having worked in the corporate sector, and I, I have to say that one of the things that I remember being taught by, by somebody that I respected tremendously is that as an executive, as a leader, you have an obligation to take care of your people if you want to build a strong organization. And I have to say, the idea that you and your executive team saw fit, and I think important Canadian building so strong Canadian business is important, but that you saw fit to take substantial bonuses and equity packages at a time when your workers, your employees, your journalists could have had their jobs saved is a bit disappointing. And I will leave that with you, Mr. Vivich. You, you have to run the company the way that you believe that is best, but I think that it's more important, it is important to think about Canadians, particularly those who have subsidized your company for so very long. Thank you. Mr. New Marvin, so, I now go to the Bloc Québécois. Martin Champoux, Martin, uh, six minutes, please. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to start by saying that I appreciate Mr. Vivich being with us today. I would also like to share with the committee that we had Mr. Vivich come in. Uh, we had heard that he had refused to come before this committee, whereas that was not true. It's that our schedule and his schedule were not lining up. I think that our actions were a little bit strong, and I think that we should reflect on this in the future. So thank you, Mr. Babich, for being with us today. Thank you for the goodwill that you're showing in answering our questions. I know that these are not comfortable topics to talk about. For the cuts made by Bell over the past year, they're very concerning, especially for regional information. This is, is something that I find particularly important. For example, in Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean, the, there is not enough coverage on local news because things are happening from Quebec City or from Montreal. How do you defend the fact that you're saying that you're investing heavily in information and local information, but when you look at the different regions, you can see the opposite, that the organization is not well done and regional coverage is not good enough. What do you think about that, Mr. Bibich? Thank you for the question. I would like to say that journalism plays an important role in our society. I think Nobody disagrees with that, and that is why in 2021, I made the decision to start Nouveau Info, to start the newsroom from the ground up to serve Quebecers in Audible. You said you, you built this from the ground up, but you purchased VTL, which had existing infrastructure. It's not that you had to buy new cameras and new consoles. You offered a new service, but the infrastructure was there that you purchased from VTL, and you developed an information service. And at that time, you were covering the regions well, but recently, even with help from the CRTC, we've seen cuts in the regions, but specifically in Quebec regions, and that is something people find concerning. Uh, à bâtir uh, un service. Uh, Nouveau Info diffuse plus de trois. Nouveau Info publishes 3,000 hours and over 300 are local news hours. We take this seriously. They've hired about 80 people. That's 25% more than when we created the service. And so it's a newsroom that is growing. And so we give our journalists a mandate to stay relevant to the viewers, and to reflect the regions that they cover. That's how we are going to serve Quebecers throughout the province. But, Mr. Bibich, I would invite you to listen to what people in the regions are saying, because it's great to have news hours, but sharing news from one city to cover other regions is not adequate. I think that you should 
Listen to the concerns from regions. They are real, and we need local information. It's essential, as you know. And we're losing that. And democracy is suffering, suffering from that, and you need to keep that in mind. I would like to come back to the most recent budget cuts from the start of this year. I know that there are cuts in different sectors at Bell, but I would like to know what the proportion, what proportion impacted customer service at Bell. I don't have the exact number of positions in customer service, but we have improved our customer service significantly. I'm very proud of the team. And you'll be able to see the data from the Complaints Commission, and the data shows that year after year, Bell is the most improved, and it's thanks to the great work done by the team throughout the country, so 12 million team members. Can you reassure people who are concerned that the cuts to customer service are delocalized and might be sent to other countries so that it, these services can be offered at lower costs? Are these concerns reasonable? No position was relocalized abroad. How will you replace these positions? Do you no longer need these customer service positions? We are becoming more efficient. If we can avoid calls and our customer service is better and with optic, fiber optic services, there are fewer service issues, there are fewer needs to send out trucks and technicians. I could give you many examples if you'd like. People communicate with us through the MyBell app, which gives subscribers the option to examine their services themselves in Audible. We've improving the apps. We've been improving apps. Go to um, the New Democrats, Nikki Ashton, for six minutes. I'll oh, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Singh, would you, for six minutes. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Jagmeet Chair. Singh. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Thank Ms. You. Madam Chair. Madam Chair, through you, um, my questions are as follows. The first one is, it's pretty clear that things are going well at Bell if you're a shareholder and a CEO, but not if you're a worker and not if you're a consumer. Bell reported a whopping $2.3 billion in profit last year. As CEO, you, uh, the chair, profited or po pocketed $13.43 million in compensation. But Canadians are paying some of the highest cell phone and internet fees in the world. You laid off in nine months over 6,000 employees. How does a profitable company justify these layoffs, particularly in light of the hundreds of millions of dollars in subsidies from the government? How do you, how do you justify that? And is it just about making even more profits? You're already profitable. So what is the justification? So, you know... When, when, we, when we make our decisions, we have our consumers front of mind in terms of media, our viewers front of mind, the investments we need to make to better serve consumers and viewers. And we're doing this in an environment with, as I said earlier uh, in, in the appearance, increasing costs, bad foreign exchange, high inflation, uh, increased competition, which Mr. is Bibish, a fundamentally I think I something good you said. thing. So we have to manage all that. Mr. Bibish, just to understand, did you say that your, dis your justification for laying off workers is because you had the consumers in mind? I, I must have misheard that, because that does not make any sense at all to me, sir. Oh, it, make, it, makes, it makes very good sense, because what we're you're trying to you, do is continue to grow. You're saying you fired 6,000 workers no, well, if I may, because if you're I may. worried about consumers. If I may, correct, because we want to continue. I have a we hard need, time we understanding want... that. Well, I thought I'll, I must have misheard I'll, you, sir, but go on then. No, no, I'll, I'll explain. What we need to do is to continue to invest in our networks, in our content, in our services to better serve consumers and viewers. And in order to continue to invest... Sir, sorry, you're saying invest, not divest. To because we need to you're, continue you're to grow firing workers and revenues. you're saying that's an investment? We need to adjust to the macroeconomic environment around us. We, in Canada, we have one of the most poorly performing economies in the industrialized world. We have a massive productivity problem, which the Bank of Canada has 
identified as a crisis. We have to adjust to that macroeconomic environment around us so that we can continue to grow our revenues, yes, so that shareholders and lenders will continue to give us capital so that we can continue to invest to better serve consumers. That's how the loop Okay. That's how it all ties together. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. So l- let me, I mean, I want to point out something just to ask you to kind of look in the mirror. You've, you've blamed, you tried to blame the government by saying the government didn't act fast enough, didn't help your company fast enough. I, I want to outline some of the choices you made because I think this is really a choice. I, I don't agree that this is something you had to do. You chose to give $3.71 billion in dividends to shareholders. You chose to buy back stocks for $140 million in 2023. You pocketed a staggering 42% pay increase from 2020 to 2023. You could have chosen to prioritize workers with that money. You could have chosen to give consumers a break and make it more affordable for cell phone and internet fees, particularly at a time when people are struggling with the cost of living. But you chose greed. How do you justify that? Those so are choices was, uh, you made. Thank you for, thank you, thank you for the, the question. I would start with um, we are continuing to lower wireless prices each and every day to the point where the, our prices are fundamentally lower than they are in the U.S. In fact, I appeared on March 18th in front of Indu, and we established all those facts. I'm sure the transcript is available. Just this week, we launched a new service uh, at very low prices uh, called No Name no Mobile, which is going to better serve customers who are in the market for lower priced cell phone plans. And as it relates to dividends, um, an important uh, fact that gets lost when it, when we have a discussion on Bell dividends is that for, we're very unique. 46% of our shareholders are individuals, individuals who rely on that dividend. And about 70% of employees at Bell are also shareholders. So that's very unique. Um, and and the, you know, the individual shareholders who invest in Bell, the individual Canadians who invest in Bell, they like the dividend, and we're supporting them as well along the way. So we're trying to, you know, fundamentally, we need to come to grips with if we don't have Canadian companies that grow and that invest in critical infrastructure like ours and that create jobs, we're going to have a massive problem in the country. And that goes for media as well. Like, we should be having a discussion, broadly speaking, because we have the right forum for this and the right individuals here. How do we fix Canadian media? Because without a Canadian broadcasting system, there will be no news, except maybe the CBC. Thank you. And we need to figure out how to keep Canadian news alive. And I'd love to have that conversation as well with the honorable members. I, again, I'm, I'm pointing out the choices you made, the choices could have been to keep the jobs. The choices could have been not to have such a massive dividend or massive stock buybacks or massive pay increases to your own compensation. And the choice could have been to keep more workers. Uh, I'll I'll end with my final question. We're always managing for the short term and the long term because if we don't make difficult choices to run our companies, I'm sorry, uh, we're also trying to preserve 40,000 jobs. Mr. Singh has the floor. My, my fun, thank Mr. you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, through you for the final question, Madam Chair, is uh, Canadians for Tax Fairness indicated that over a four-year period of time that using tax evasion tactics, including tax loopholes, that Bell as a company was able to avoid paying $1 billion in taxes. I'm wondering how much do you plan to avoid paying this year in taxes? Oh, you, I need to get, if you could, if Chair, if, if the Honourable Member could kindly provide uh, that report, we'd be happy to provide a, a response to the clerk. I'm not aware of that report. Absolutely. It's publicly available. It's the Canadians for Tax Fairness, and I'm sure they have a public website as well. We can absolutely make that clear to you, but I'm curious about how much you're trying to avoid paying taxes again this year. I, uh, I will take, a, we will take a look at the report and file an answer so we can give a, a considered answer to the, to the very good question. Thank you. We look at that answer, Mr. Bibich, being sent to the clerk of the committee. Now, we go to a second round, and it's a five-minute round. And once again, I stress five minutes are for questions and answers. And I'm going to go to the Conservatives for Rachel Thomas for five minutes, please, Ms. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bibich, uh, in the last eight months, you have cut a total of 6,100 jobs. Um, in February, just a couple months ago, there were 4,800 jobs cut. Uh, according to legislation, 
um, the federal labor standards, Bell was required to give the government 16 weeks notice of this layoff. I'm curious as to whether or not that was given. I apologize, I was muted remotely. Uh, we, uh, we complied with all legislation as it relates to, um, to the actions that were taken with respect to the positions in question. Okay, so I just want to confirm then, you gave 16 weeks notice that these layoffs were going to take place in February. No, we complied with all requirements as it relates to the process by which we are permitted to reduce the, the, the positions in question. I understand. So according to the federal labor standards, you're supposed to give a 16 weeks notice or seek an exemption. Which one is it? We complied with uh, all the requirements with respect to uh, federal labor laws in this respect. Right. So I'm just curious, did you seek the exemption or did you give the 16 weeks notice to the government? No, we complied with all requirements that we were imposed under federal law. M Mr. Bibic, is there a reason why you're evading the question? There's only two choices here. You either had to seek exemption based on the code or you had to get, give 16 weeks notice. Which one was it? Rob, do you have a, Robert, do you have a precise answer to that? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, the Mr. Malcolmson, go ahead. The question's been asked and answered now, I think, four times. We, we have complied with applicable federal legislation. If you require more detail, we're happy to provide it, but we've fully complied with our labor legislation requirements in implementing this workforce reduction. I, I'm sorry, I'm... I'm baffled as to why a straight answer is not being granted. There are two options here. Either 16 weeks notice has to be given to the government of Canada that these layoffs are taking place, or an exemption has to be granted from the government of Canada. It's one of these two options. So which one did Bell take? I think we've answered the question. Where, no, where sir, notice, with where... all due respect, I don't think you have. I think you continue to evade the question, uh, which looks rather shady and as if Bell Media has something, or Bell, sorry, has something to hide. What are you hiding? In the, in the short time we're being given to answer your questions, we, we are telling you that short time. you have complied. Either, either you know that you provided notice or you sought an exemption. That's not difficult. You what two lead we, the company. Why do you not have answers to these questions? What we know is we complied. You laid with off 6,100 people and you don't know the process that you followed to do that? We know the process and we complied. Mr. Bivik, did you receive a thir $13 million? This is what you get paid $13 million for? I. To the honourable member, we answer the question. There, there's actually. Mr. Bivik, you have not been able to answer a single one of my questions directly today. M Ms. Thomas, we we gave, we complied with labour legislation. We gave the requisite notice, and we've complied. So, you asked the question. We gave the notice. We're compliant. You have two choices: either you gave 16 weeks' notice, or you sought an exemption. We gave a notice, as I just said. You gave notice 16 weeks ahead of time. We gave the requisite notice, yes. So 16 weeks ahead of time, you gave notice to the government that you were going to lay off 4,800 people. I, I've answered the question. We gave the requisite required notice in connection with the restructuring, yes. What was the requisite notice? The requisite notice was the notice that we gave, depending on which element of the workforce was affected. How, how far ahead of time I've, did you have to give that? It, it may have varied. That's why I have offered to provide complete details in terms of who we notified when in compliance with our requirements. Okay. But the government knew about these layoffs? Well, we provided 20 notice. 20 seconds. You provided notice to the... We... Uh, we gave notice and provided um, salary, the minimum salary of 16 weeks. So we were fully compliant. Why did it take me five minutes to get a straight answer? The, the answer hasn't changed, which is that we were compliant. No, it absolutely has. You evaded for the first four and a half minutes, and then finally in the last 30 seconds, I finally got an answer. Why? 
Do you, do you think what? this is a joke? Do you enjoy wasting my time? These are technical issues. There's nothing which... technical about it. Either you know the legislation or you don't. You either followed it or you didn't, and you said you did. Therefore, you must know what, you did, what, what was carried out. There were specific details and requirements under the legislation that I knew we complied with, but I didn't have the specific details at my fingertips when you first asked the question, but I knew that we were fully compliant, which is why I answered as such, and the answer has not changed. Sorry, Ms. Ms. Thomas, the time is up. Um, we over, in fact, we're a little over time here. Um, and I want to go now to um, Anjou Delon from the Liberals. Ms. Delon. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Five and Yes, thank you so much, um, and thank you to our witnesses for being here. Uh, I'd like to have uh, some follow-up questions. Um, first of all, were 16 weeks notice or 16 weeks notice? Madame service? la Présidente, est-ce que je peux demander à ma collègue d'éloigner <coughs> l'écouteur de son microphone pour éviter ah. le retour? Apologies, there's some uh, some feedback happening. Is that similar? C'est pour les interprètes. OK. Parfait. Uh, so, I would like to know, uh, were 16 weeks of notice or 16 weeks of severance provided? We gave notice and all employees are therefore paid during uh, the full 16 weeks at minimum. And the way they were all <laughs> fired at the same time, can you talk to us a little bit about their personal situations uh, when it came to that? Yeah, so, I, um, Chair, I, I, just for clarification, I believe that would be in respect of the unionized uh, team uh, members with that question, because it depends on the, if you're management or union or non-management, we, we had a different process. What is the division of the roles that were cut um, of all the talented team members? Well, there would be... Um, so, you know, there would be about 850 of the, uh, of the 4,800 that were vacant positions. So those positions were eliminated. Um, about 800 of the positions were uh, unionized team members, and 60% uh, of those uh, chose a voluntary separation package, so they identified themselves as being willing to, to depart the company. Um, and then there were uh, management team members, and, this, and across the board, all 4,800, less the vacant positions, of course, where there was no individual attached to the position. It's, uh, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult, for them in particular, very difficult decision to make, but more fundamentally for each of those individuals affected. And uh, we acknowledge their vast contributions to Bell, and that's why we made sure to follow the legislative requirements, provide... Term, you know, separation packages, career transition packages, and continued uh, benefits. Uh, sorry. Excuse me. Sorry. Can... There's feedback from your microphone we are hearing from the interpreters. So if you have a device close to the microphone, can you move it away? Sure. Thank you. Is the feedback still there? Interpreters? I think she'll have to speak so that we can know. Now? Say something? Anything? Do you hear any feedback right now? No. It's no good. Feedback. I've stopped the clock, by the way, so you may continue now, Ms. Dillon. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, what means were given uh, to give notice at the time of firing? Uh, for... Uh Again, so just to clarify, because I, I do want to give, uh, properly answer uh, the honorable member's question, is that with respect to the unionized team members or the management members, because there's a different process. Was it email? Was it text message? I mean, Zoom? <laughs> no. It, it, like, generally speaking, the individuals affected had uh, individual meetings either in person or by video so that we could communicate the, um, the news and the details around the separation packages and continued benefits and career transition services were applicable. And uh, can you please clarify after uh, Bell got all this money why these layoffs, firings still happen? It's 
quite mind-boggling, and a lot of my colleagues, pretty much all of them, have asked that question uh, without any answer. What was the justification? Well, the you know, in, in the, let's focus first on Bell Media. Um, there are massive losses in conventional TV, $180 million. Our new service loses $40 million a year. Uh, advertising revenues declined $140 million 2023 over 2022. And we need to adjust to those circumstances. The Canadian economy is not faring uh, very well. In terms of advertising, uh, advertising has shifted to digital channels. I mean, even the federal government has 70% uh, of the federal government's advertising budget has gone to digital. That's $48 million. I mean, that's just a, a, an example to show you that even the federal government is driving its advertising dollars to digital. So we've had to adjust and we've had to but pivot Bell, towards digital Bell as well. A, Bell is a telecom and media conglom conglomerate that generates in Canada, 15 times the annual revenue of Netflix, um, who, unlike Bell, uh, can't use its streaming services to sell home and mobile internet. So your argument, I'm sorry, with all due respect, so far uh, has not made any sense throughout the entire testimony. Well, well, if, if, you know, if the macroeconomic circumstances that we operate in are extremely difficult, if the regulatory environment is particularly difficult, uh, competition has increased, which is a great thing for consumers, but that means prices are going down. Every company will have to adjust to that kind of environment. Now, Netflix is eight times bigger than Bell. Disney seven times bigger than Bell. Amazon is 63 times bigger than Bell, and they compete directly against us and generate more revenues in Canada and streaming than, than we do. And uh, they have to contribute nothing to the yeah, Canadian media industry. We, That's what we should be talking we about, We don't give actually. money to those companies. We give money to Bell. And it seems like Bell expects Ottawa to go back to the old bargain of uh, protecting them from competition and, you know, tilting the rules in their uh, favor and just continuing with that monopoly. No, not at all. We welcome competition, actually. And because we compete against Disney, Netflix, Amazon, <laughs> Apple... Um, that's why we're, and because those companies derive billions of dollars in revenue in Canada is why we say they too should be required to contribute to the same extent as the Canadian media companies are. I mean, if we don't confront this reality, you, there Mr. will Bibich. be no Canadian media industry in Canada. Thank you. We're over time. I'm going to go to Mr. Shampoo now. Martin, two and a half minutes, please. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Monsieur Bibic. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be quick because I only have two and a half minutes and it goes by very quickly, so I'll try to be brief. Bell received some assistance from the CRTC, which allowed for some savings. And we saw about 6,000 job losses in Bell and in different sectors. I know it's a big company, but still. Bell stated investing in information, but we see that regional information and regional information in Quebec, uh, Sherbrooke, Trois-Rivières, Saguenay, local information is of lower quality than it was a few years ago. Bell is asking for a fair playing field with web giants, but how can you guarantee with your current history that this support is going to further weaken coverage in regions of Quebec and weaken French culture, and that's part of your mandate as well. The most important thing, or rather the f our main goal, is to serve consumers and viewers, and that is what we do. We create news and go well beyond the minimum requirements imposed by the CRTC, and that's where you can find some trust in us. We create 150% more than what we need. We have created, as I mentioned, Nouveau Info, a service in Quebec. We started this from the ground up, and we have a bilingual, we have bilingual service. I'm hearing your accomplishments, and I've heard your lines, but what we're seeing concretely when you say that you're doing more than 
what is required, it would give the impression that because regions are not well served, well, then perhaps regulation needs to be strengthened to force you to do more because we want the regions to be better served than they are now. That's what I would like you to say. It's true where we removed journal po journalism positions, yes, we would like to reinvest and put journals out there because local information cannot be coming from the big centers, Mr. Bibic. Thank you for the question. The ecosystem has been shaken in Canada and North, North America, and it, we need to level out the playing field and force those operating in Canada, so the web giants, to contribute to the ecosystem in Quebec and in Canada. And that's how we will ensure proper news coverage in the regions. Bitch, thank you. And I now go to, um, to Nikki Ashton for the NDP for two point five minutes, please, Nikki. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I think we've seen on full display here uh, the extent to which corporate Canada is disconnected and, frankly, arrogant. Uh, the sheer audacity to come before this committee, complain that refusing to show up until the end of May isn't avoiding accountability, and then insisting that more support from government is necessary while millions of Canadians are struggling and thousands of your workers are laid off boggles the mind. But let's take a moment to look at the facts, not the ones on the Facts Matter website combating fake news. And I have a, 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 a copy here, especially point number 10, directed at us, members of the committee, uh, clarifying why you told us it would take almost three, uh, um, almost three months for you to show up here. The reality is that government regulates your industry, both in terms of broadcasting and telecommunications. And this committee oversees that work. Uh, we were clear, and we have been clear, that you needed to be here much sooner. So let's get to the, the main issues of today. Over an eight-month period, Bell eliminated 6,000 jobs, including February's announcement of 4,800 job cuts. At the same time, you announced an increase in dividend checks for shareholders. You claim that Bell was forced into the decision to fire so many workers because the federal government has been slow to de deliver help. You've been quoted as saying, we continue to face a difficult economy and government and regulatory decisions that undermine investment in our networks, fail to support our media business in a time of crisis. A time of crisis. Where I come from, a crisis is wildfires, is thousands of people losing their jobs, kind of like the ones that used to work for Bell Media that you fired. Who's in crisis, Mr. Bibic? You, with your millions of dollars of compensation, or the workers you just fired? So, um, Chair, my pleasure to answer those questions. I, uh, I keenly wanted to be before this committee on March 19th, and I had committed that. In fact, I had been in front of Indu on March 18th, and it's the committee that rescheduled my appearance, and uh, I'm here, and uh, I always am eager to have a public policy discourse, as I mentioned earlier. Um, again, with respect to dividends, these dividends my, my question is about the Canadians crisis. Who's, each and every, who, each and every who's in crisis? Is it you or, or the workers, the thousands of workers that you laid off? What's undeniable is that the Canadian media ecosystem is in is in crisis, and 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 one can only need to ask Post Media and Salt Wire and print journalism in the country, and our our direct traditional media. Thank you, Mr. Bibic. Uh, I think uh, it would be good to hear from uh, what well, we've all heard from Bell Media workers that have lost their jobs, and uh, I think it's pretty clear that they're the ones facing the crisis. Your board recently gave you a 20 percent raise. If you truly feel for the thousands of workers you laid off, would you consider taking a nine percent reduction in your own salary? As I mentioned earlier, the um, the so yes, yes ranks or no. have been have been thinned out significantly since I became CEO. So because we're always vigilant around uh, around uh, costs and around the number of executives we we have, and that's resulted in a forty percent uh, decrease in compensation. Well, I take that as a no. Direct Thank you. Of the well, CEO. time. Okay. Now I go to um, to the Conservatives for five minutes. Um, Rachel Thomas. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bibic, I just want to be really clear here. Uh, my question is with regards to the federal labor standards having to do with termination, layoff, or dismissal. Uh, my question is not whether or not you gave the employees adequate notice, but whether or not you gave the government adequate notice. 
Um, according to the group termination clause, you must give 16 weeks before the termination of employment takes effect, and you must give that notice to the labor program's head of compliance and enforcement, and immediately send a written copy to the Government of Canada. So I'm curious if that was done. The, um, uh, the legislative requirements also allow for the giving of notice combined with guaranteed 16 weeks salary continuous continuance, my apologies. So if we give 16 weeks salary continuance, um, as well as notice, we are in compliance with the federal legislative requirements. So I just want to be clear, you gave notice to the Government of Canada 16 weeks before terminating. If we give notice to the Government of Canada before the implementation of the job reductions, but combine that with a guaranteed 16 weeks of salary continuance to all employees, even those who may not otherwise have been eligible for a full 16 weeks, then we are compliant. So again, um, I'm just looking for clarification then. You are confirming one way or the other, just yes or no. Did you give the Government of Canada 16 weeks notice before terminating the employment of these 4,800 individuals in February? It is not required that the federal government get 16 weeks advance notice if the federal government gets advance notice and each employee is otherwise guaranteed 16 weeks salary continuance, even in cases where they otherwise would not be. Uh, Mr. Bibic, I have the federal labor standards in front of me and that is not what I'm reading. You are required to give the government 16 weeks notice or apply for an exemption. I've provided the full answer to the process that we adopted, which is in full compliance with federal regulatory requ federal legislative requirements. Mr. Bibic, when did you tell the government that you would be laying off these employees? That I don't know. But you just said that you're in full compliance. How can you be sure of that? Because I know we gave the government notice and I know that we guaranteed each employee 16 weeks of salary continuance, even in cases when they otherwise would not have been eligible for it. Mr. Bibic, I, I understand that you're, you're treating this as a bit of a game and, and mincing your words. Um, I'm just looking for a straight answer. You, you said that you gave the government notice. Perhaps you can call on your colleague if you need some assistance here. Um, when was that notice given? Why, why don't we, if, if we may, Madam Chair, provide uh, an undertaking to provide that information to the committee in writing so that you have the fulsome explanation in front of you? Your questions are important, but I, in the time permitted, it's difficult to answer them. With all due respect, you're welcome to table a lengthy reply and, and nuance your words. But in this moment, I'm just asking for yes or no. Was 16 weeks notice given to the government? You, you seem to be indicating yes. And so I'm curious then, on what date was that 16 weeks notice given? So that's not what I said. I said that if an employer commits to providing 16 weeks salary continuance, then the 16-week advance notice to the government, you can follow a different path than the one that the honorable member has outlined. But we did give notice to the federal government. I just don't have the specific date at my fingertips. We, we gave notice on February 8th, Madam Chair. Thank you. That didn't seem so hard. Bravo. All right, February 8th, the government was given advance notice that you would be laying off 4,800 people from Bell Canada. Thank you. I very much appreciate that. Now, you're telling me then that that notice was given on the exact same day that the public found out. But again, according to the labor standards, um, notice is supposed to be in advance. Why was it done the day of? Well, or, or, two things. The, the, go ahead, Rob. I, I'm sorry, I was just, we, we've given the answer. Uh, we provided the notice in compliance with the legislation. We're happy to provide more details if you require more details, but the question's been asked and answered repeatedly. It, it hasn't actually. Um, I just found out less than a minute ago that you gave notice on February 8th. That's the same day that it was publicly uh, declared that these 
individuals, these 4,800 individuals would be fired. That's not exactly advance notice, which is what's required under the federal label standards. Why wasn't advance notice given? We've provided the answer to that. There's a path, which is if you guarantee salary continuance for 16 weeks, that is a path even where the employee otherwise would not be entitled to 16 weeks. The second point is that while we gave advance notice, while we gave notice to the government on February 8th, those uh, job reductions then all take place on February 8th all at the same time. Thank you, Ms. Thank you very much. We're over time. Ms. Thomas and I now go for the Liberals to Patricia, Patricia Latanzio. Patricia? Thank you, Madam Chair. My questions, uh, I'm going to take you a little bit uh, in terms of questions with regards to the uh, the fees, um, the Part 2 fees, uh, to be specific. So for how long did Bell pay the Part 2 fees to the CRTC, Mr. Bibic? Uh, I'll, I'll answer that, if you don't mind. We, we paid Part 2 fees uh, from the date upon which we uh, first acquired CTV, which was 2011, 2012. Over the period of time we paid those Part 2 fees, Dell remitted approximately $400 million of, of Part 2 license fees. And it's important to recognize those fees were a tax that were collected by the CRTC and then remitted to the Government of Canada's Consolidated Revenue Fund. And it's also important to note that those fees were never paid by the OTT, foreign OTT streamers like Netflix that we operate in competition okay. with. When did Bell stop paying these fees? When the Online Streaming Act came into effect, one of the provisions was to uh, enable private broadcasters who had been paying that tax to no longer have to pay that tax in order to partially level the playing field between... Can you uh, give us a date in a year? Uh, with the on Online Streaming Act came into effect last year. So in 2023? Yes. Okay. So what savings does this represent for Bell over the next 10 years? Well, the, t the, the tax has been eliminated. Our share of the tax when it was payable was $40 million. So $40 million per year. Is that correct? That's what we were remitting. Okay. So for the next 10 years, that would represent $400 million, correct? It depends Give on or how take. Depends on how the tax is calculated in any given year. But for the sake of maintaining some sort of logic here, if it's $40 million in 2022, in 10 years, we're looking at about easy $400 million. Well, none of us have a crystal wall as to how the world would unfold over the next uh, okay. Let, period of time. Okay, so in the, in, the, in the last, say, three, four years, has it been around $40 million per year? Has that been the average? In the in the most recently completed year in which we paid the tax, it was $40 million. In 21? What was it in 21? I don't have that number sitting in front of me. Okay. So my point is the following. Why didn't Bell reinvest these savings in, into its newsrooms and local uh, journalists? Oh, we... Uh, we We've ma invested massively in the delivery of news. We're actually delivering more news than we have we ever have in more ways. My question actually. is: no, My question is in local journalists and newsrooms. We, we did. We invested significantly more. That's why we have 35 percent more news correspondents today than we did in 2023. That's why we launched Nouveau Info to serve uh, the francophone viewer in the province of Quebec and elsewhere. That's why we now have uh, journalists in 10 provinces, all 10 provinces, whereas before. We, uh, we didn't, and we spend $300 million a year, close to $300 million a year, in producing news and significantly more than the requirements. It's, it's how we're doing it that's differently. Yeah. We're driving, we're generating efficiencies behind much, the camera how much did you so that we can deliver more news in front of the camera because the viewer matters the most. How much did you reinvest? Oh, we invested. We invested 1.7 billion dollars in content. 300 million, close to 300 million dollars, was in news, the local and national news across the country. And we invested significantly, like I, I mentioned in my opening statement, over a billion dollars since I became CEO to improve our um, our infrastructure and our platforms, and to launch digital platforms like CTV News and the CP24 online, and then the web and the app, so that we can better serve viewers. Viewers today want news as it happens 
all the time. They don't want to, you know, appointment viewing is, is no longer nearly as relevant as it was before. So we've invested massively to change how we so deliver the news so that the viewer can be served all day long. How does Bell anticipate using its portion of the Google Media Fund? Uh, well, we haven't negotiated that yet. It will be a very, very small number in the, in, in the end for, for Bell. So we'll continue driving forward. We're making sure that as much investment as possible is in the delivery, in the production of news, driving efficiencies in our infrastructure so that we can invest in creating digital platforms so that there's news at all times of the day for couldn't, our viewers. Couldn't these funds be used to offset the revenue seconds. losses cited, cited in BC's restructuring? Well, the, the, the announcement the, of Feb 2024 and thus reduce the impacts of jobs and programming? We, we're driving as many efficiencies as we possibly can in terms of common infrastructure, common uh, equipment, having journalists uh, you know, file stories on all our CTV platforms rather than being dedicated to only one show. That's how we're going to ensure that we deliver news at every point in time as it breaks, as it happens on whatever platform the consumer wants. If they want digital, it's there. If they want online, it's there. If they want to go on YouTube, we'll make sure that CP24 is there. If they want to sit and walk down in front of the TV and watch Sandy thank Ronaldo you, at 530, you, Bibby, she's an amazing talent. Time. We have news there. Thank you. I'm going to a third round. Uh, and again, we have uh, for five minutes for the Conservatives, Jamil Giovanni. Thank you, Madam Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Bibich, uh, let's talk, shall we? Um, in recent years, several of Bell Media's female employees have left your company amid accusations of discrimination. Patricia Jagernoth left CP24, claiming she was being tokenized as a black woman. Danielle uh, Graham left CTV eTalk, claiming that it was in part due to sexism. And of course, we've seen multiple media reports suggesting that Lisa Laflamme was pushed out of CTV News due to ageism. Now, of course, Bell celebrates its supposed commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is all over your website, Mr. Bibich. But I am curious to know uh, if you can clarify to Canadians, should Canadians be concerned about a pattern of deplorable employment practices at Bell Media? So we uh, thank you for, uh, for the question. Uh, the, um, the issue that's being surfaced is uh, very, very important and we do take it very seriously. We have, I'm very proud of the talented group of diverse journalists that we have across the country. And, um, you know, the, the, the job reductions were um, kind of difficult and unfortunate. I mean, a, a smaller number of the broader number uh, affected Bell Media directly, but we have the same percentage now as before of, uh, of diverse uh, journalists, and we have a lot of phenomenal you know, uh, accomplishments and success stories like Sandy Ronaldo, who se celebrated 50 years on air. TSN would be a great example. We have uh, credibly talented women broadcasters and you know we were the first to have an all women NBA broadcast, for example. And if you take the broader bell, um, if you look at kind of the CEO and the direct reports, that's me and the people who um, who uh, directly uh, report to me before I became CEO, 15 percent uh, were women. Now it's 30 percent. And then one level below that, the senior vice president layer of, of BCE in 2019, 20 percent, 20 percent were women. And now it's double that. Mr. So we Bibic, take it seriously. There's Mr. more Bibic, work to do, of course. It's if never, I could just suggest, yeah, we got to do more. It sounds to me like you may be proving some of the allegations correct in your response, given you're engaging in tokenism in your answer. None of this uh, hiring of people based on quotas or percentages, as you seem to be indicating, would necessarily uh, make Bell immune from the allegations made of tokenism, racism, sexism, and ageism. So do you have a response to those concerns and whether Canadians should be worried that one of the largest media companies in the country has a pattern of deplorable employment practices? No, I would um, think we, it's an issue that we take very seriously. So if there are incidents, we will investigate them and make sure they are addressed. But more broadly, we, um, we seek to do better each and every year. And we, we want to have the 
as diverse uh, a, a workforce as possible at all levels of the company, men, women, and of course, uh, talent uh, and employees from uh, from community, you know, black, indigenous, and people of color community, those communities as well. It's a very important issue. Thank you for for raising it. When you laid off uh, five thousand workers, and if you could not evade it this time, I'd appreciate it. When you laid off five thousand workers, what percentage of them were black or indigenous? I don't have these specific numbers at, at my fingertips, but we could file that with the clerk. Yeah, that would be great if you could file that, because uh, I'd be curious to know what role diversity, equity, and inclusion policies play when deciding to fire 5,000 Canadian workers. For example, do you have separate Zoom calls for the black workers and the white workers, or what, what, how do you approach that? Well, we... Um, so what, are you referring to, again, the 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 employees who form part the unionized non-management unionized employees or the management groups because the management groups would have had individual I'm talking those, in total those in management would have had individual you, you've meetings. given us a word salad so far about how important DEI is to your company and yet it doesn't seem that you thought about DEI when firing 5,000 Canadian workers so I'd like some clarity on the role DEI plays when firing 5,000 people Madam Chair, I'm not sure why uh, the Honourable Member phrased the question in, in that manner. I, I did indicate that as it relates to Bell Media, we have the same percentage now of diverse journalists as we uh, did uh, prior to the restructuring. And as it relates to how we communicate with employees, they were individual meetings. And there was a separate process with respect to the unionized employees that we discussed in advance with UNIFOR, the union in question, that, who uh, fully endorsed the process that we adopted which I'm happy to go into if we have the time. but No, you don't, actually. This time has now got one second left in it. So I'm going to move now to the next um, speaker up, and that is uh, for the Liberals, Mr. Newmarket. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Bibich, I just want to clear up uh, something that uh, a number of my colleagues have, have tried to uh, get answers from, and so I just want to be clear crystal clear, and this should respond to the question Ms. Thomas asked, that Ms. Dillon asked, that others have asked. Does it sound familiar to you that the Government of Canada received the notice of the layoffs at or around the same time that the public did? Yes, the notice was given on February 8th. When were the layoffs done? Well, they proceeded thereafter, but it's not... That day, not that every, week, that every... month, that hour... Well, there were 4,800, so it was staged over several weeks. And when did they begin? That I don't have the exact data. So okay, the they began, that, they began yeah. that day. Just so that you know, they began that day. And you did point out that you gave 16 weeks working notice. And it's important to clarify for every single person in this room and watching this, that 16 weeks working notice does not mean that you gave the government of Canada 16 weeks notice, but that you gave the government of Canada zero days notice, and you gave your workers zero days notice, but you paid them for 16 weeks thereafter from the day that they were terminated. Does that sound correct? In some cases, the employees... Um you know, had their individual meetings and were given specific notice on, you know, days and weeks after February 8th. So in th that respect for those employees, the, the, the information would have been shared with them days or weeks later. So for avoidance of doubt, you did not provide 16 weeks advance notice to the government of Canada that you were doing these layoffs, correct? That's correct. And that's what I specifically answered in respect of the uh, of, of the prior question, which is that we gave notice to the government of Canada, but 16 weeks salary continuance to all employees who were affected, even those right. who no, otherwise no, I just, would not have had. What I don't to. want, what I don't want, is people leaving this room with the misapprehension that somehow the government of Canada knew for 16 weeks before a single person was laid off. Laid off. And so I want to thank you for clarifying that in fact that was not the case. Now. With that done, with that said, I do want to go back, uh, Mr. Bibich, to a conversation that we had earlier where you talked about the importance of building strong Canadian companies. And I agree with you. I think building strong Canadian companies is important because those Canadian companies should provide good jobs and that those employees should have certainty that their Com that the companies for which they work, that they give everything to, is going to take care of them, respect them, and ensure that they have a strong trajectory for their careers. 
I don't know how that worked for the 6,000 people that you laid off, um, but I know how it worked, and we've talked about the executive bonuses. What I want to talk about a little bit is your newsrooms. Newsrooms are a big part of this country's ability to tell its stories and about good quality information to be provided. Can you tell us, since you took on these, since you did these layoffs, how much have you expanded, if you've expanded, um, the size of your news team and specifically where? So we... um we continue to deliver more news than uh, than we ever have before. We have 35% more national news correspondents than when we began the 2023 restructuring, which has been referred to uh, throughout our, our, our time together. We've grown Nouveau Info in Quebec by 25% since we launched it in 2021. Um, we, for the first time, will have, as I've mentioned, journalists in all 10 provinces, whereas before we did not. Do you so have them? Be covering but, but New Mr. Brunswick and Newfoundland, Labrador, mm-hmm. and Saskatchewan, and there's another province. Uh, so yeah, but 10 covers all of them. No, I, I, I appreciate what yeah. you're saying. But I'm My question to you, though, which ones are new? but in, in small communities, in rural communities, in underserved communities, are you increasing or decreasing your footprint. I mean, this is not where you say to me in every major city, in every major, every major city across the country, we have reporters. My question to you is, what are you doing to put reporters into smaller communities, rural communities, indigenous communities, so on and so forth? The, you know, we have the journalists that I that we do have, and at, that has grown to the extent that I've shared with you. Uh, their mandate is to cover news stories as they break where the news happens and to make sure that those stories are filed and delivered the way consumers, viewers want to engage with that news. And more and more, that's on digital platforms. But, you know, it's, a, it's you know, we've lost $40 million a year on, on, on news. I mean, we should be talking about that as well. well let's, is, let's, uh, let's talk about that. But Absolutely. it is an industry I'm that's so, under, I'm so it's pleased. an industry that's under I, I'm so tremendous pleased you raised, stress I'm so pleased you raised that because you mentioned that you took a $14 million loss in your newsroom, but you got a $14 million waiver of fees in order to make sure that you did not have to worry too much about your newsroom. So I know that we've run out of time, but perhaps one of my other colleagues might like to ask the question, how on earth do you justify saying on one hand that you took a $40 million loss, come to us, thanks to the Conservatives and the NDP, you got that $40 million bucks back, and then you still proceeded to gut your newsrooms. Well, the, the, the news division is operated under CTV network, and the CTV conventional stations lose $185 million a year. Our advertising revenues declined $140 million from 23 to, from 23 compared to 2022. And, and there's only one revenue stream, and it's advertising. And when the federal government of Canada, which is one of the massive advertisers in the country, spends 70% of their advertising budget on digital platforms, which predominantly goes to Meta and Google, it creates massive stress on the entire media ecosystem. And so we need to have a conversation around how we fix Canadian media, because otherwise there will be no Canadian broadcasting system, news or otherwise. And then there will be no Canadian stories being told to Canadians. There will be no news, national or local, being delivered to Canadians, except maybe Radio Canada and CBC, which, Thank you. which is an the altogether time is different now debate. Well over. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to go to Martin Champoux for two and, two and a half minutes. Martin. Je Madame la Présidente, qu'on parle de... Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy that we're talking about regional news and local coverage. I understand that the media ecosystem is in a crisis. We've been saying it for years, and different governments did not act quickly enough. But Bell is a major player in Canada, and that comes with responsibilities, Mr. Bibich. And one of those responsibilities is moral and social, and you need to carry out your mandate as best you can. When I look at the data, Bell's not in the red. I understand that you perhaps have been losing some money, but there's still profits being made at Bell. So you have some wiggle room still. When we look at media coverage in eastern Quebec, for example, the situation has been critical for years, and Bell is coming out of that, is leaving that area. And so that's even less media coverage in saguenay lac saint jean And I gave you an example earlier this winter, there was a very concerning situation 
people were stuck and needed rescuing on a river. And for people in that region, it was essential information, and there was nobody from Bell to cover that because regional information was being shared through a newsletter from Quebec City. And so you can't say that you've invested in information and that you have journalists throughout Canada in all 10 provinces when you're leaving the regions behind and you say, well, there's going to be CBC and Radio-Canada to cover the regions. I know that there's an issue to solve regarding fairness in the market, but web giants aren't going to be doing any journalism. Their responsibility falls back to broadcasters, and Bell is probably the biggest in Canada. I would like to hear you. This is a cry from the heart here. Can you tell to Quebecers today that once there's fairness in the market between web giants who are abusing the system and broadcasters that need to follow heavy guidelines, we're all aware of this, would you then commit to reinvesting in the cuts and in coverage that has been lacking in Quebec? Can you say to Quebecers, yes, once this is done, once we have the room that we need, and once we can face the media giants, we will reinvest in regional news. Can you say that today? Okay, who is... I need a very short answer to that question, please. Merci. Pour assurer la pérennité. For the ecosystem in Canada and news in Canada, we would need to have fair rules. Web giants would have to contribute. The federal government would need to invest further in more traditional Canadian media, media to help us transform. But will you reinvest in regional journalism, Mr. Bibich? I will act in good faith. Cutting you 56 Thank seconds you. later, so I'm giving you enough time, Martin. So I need to know, let the people answering the questions try to be as as concise in your answers as possible. Thank you. I now go to Nikki Ashton. Nikki, for two and a half minutes. Oligopolies like Bell's are hurting Canadians. Nowhere is that more evident than in my province of Manitoba. In 2017, we were told that Bell buying out MTS would bring in better rates and service. With the Liberals' approval, you spent $3.9 billion to purchase Manitoba Telecom Services, a company that was at one time proudly publicly owned. Not only have our rates gone up, the quality of the service has gone down, no doubt linked to the fact that you cut over 45% of the Manitoba workforce. This reality is clear in our region. Here I have a picture shared by my constituent, Suzanne Sinclair, who lives in Dallas. She's forced to use a walkie-talkie to communicate with her 89-year-old veteran father who lives down the road because Bell MTS's landlines don't work in their community. Why? Because Bell MTS refuses to do the maintenance required. Landlines that belong to Bell MTS in Canada in 2024. But perhaps the most egregious example of the way in which Bell MTS has taken Manitobans for granted is Blood Vein First Nation that was in communication with Bell MTS about setting up and operating a cell phone tower for, uh, uh, for a number of months starting in 2020. A year later, when the wildfires of 2021 hit the region, the First Nation asked to work with Bell urgently. At this point, they had built a cell phone tower. They had the equipment set up. All they needed from Bell was to turn on a switch and get the cell phones working. As the wildfires raged and multiple communities were evacuated, including theirs, the smoke engulfed Winnipeg and reached southern Ontario. Bell MTS told Bloodvane they had to pay $652,000 to turn a switch and get cell service to a community that was eight miles from a burning wildfire. Cell service that could help lives. Oligopolies like yours have failed Manitobans, First Nations, workers, and Canadians across the board. Do you find it acceptable that your company rejected Blood Vein's requests at a time of real crisis? Will you work with them to get them cell service? Madam Chair, I'll, uh, 
uh, we'll communicate with the clerk to uh, to get the information as it relates to that specific uh, situation as well as the uh, customer to which the honorable uh, member referred to and as far as uh, Bell's investments in Manitoba we made a commitment when we acquired MTS to invest at least a billion dollars and I'm proud to say we invested well above that and that it's allowed us to build fiber to the home networks in Churchill and Flint Flon in LaSalle in Morden Mr. Bibic I think the uh, the questions that we've raised here are, are ones of, of real crisis and, and, and I'm, I'm and disappointed I haven't heard your intent uh, to work with blood vein and get them cell service and let me move to the question on cell phone rates Canadians pay some of the highest cell phone rates in the world and uh, uh, and my question is what will you do to cut down cell phone rates Me too. At a time when uh, you and your fellow CEOs are making $62 million in profits. Madam Chair, very quickly on that, I'd encourage all members to review the transcripts of our appearance at Indu on March 18th, and we categorically laid out the facts showing that our pricing is very competitive, has declined dramatically, uh, and, and the, the, the premise of, of, of the question no longer holds. It may have perhaps at some point in time many, many years ago, and our wireless pricing is uh, uh, lower than in the United Mr. States. Mr. Bibich, thank you. I now go to um, the Conservatives. Kevin Wall for five minutes, please, Kevin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it takes decades to establish trust in Canadian newsrooms, something that CTV has taken pride of over the time that Mr. Bibic, uh, Bell Media, has owned CTV twice in the last 40 years. Local news has always been the staple for CTV Network. Anybody can buy American programming, and we'll get to that in a moment. But it takes investment into newsrooms to solidify the integrity of the entire network. By eliminating, and you have eliminated, noon newscasts. You've eliminated late-night newscasts. You've eliminated weekend newscasts, giving many outlets in Saskatchewan, in Western Canada, in fact, all over this country, little say. You have destroyed what has taken decades to build the CTV network. I know because I was one of them for four decades. I worked three to midnight. I worked weekends. I worked holidays. I cherish those times. Why? Because I gave back to the community. You have gutted local newsrooms in this country. Don't tell me you've had it. We're down to one hour a day live in Saskatoon. Regina does everything. We in Saskatoon only have one newscast now, six to seven. We had six and a half hours of local news every day until you made your decision in the spring. You and your organization have destroyed local news in this country. You should be ashamed. I'm telling you right now, as a 40-year employee of CTV, I've watched you and your network absolutely destroy every 216 First Avenue North. You've destroyed Vancouver. You've destroyed Edmonton, Calgary, Saskatoon. I can go on and on and on. What have you done at the boardroom to say that you've invested in news when I have the other facts that say you have pulled every, absolutely every available person in every newsroom in this country that belonged to Bell Media? Madam Chair, I, I, I do need a little bit of time to respond to you know, some s serious allegations here, and, and there's serious issues that are being raised, I would like a bit of time. I won't take too long. Um, we are making sure that we deliver more stories to Canadian viewers. Uh, as far as it relates to the noon hour newscasts that were cancelled, the ratings have been down 43%. Canadians have shifted to watch, engaging with our news digitally. I'll give you one very good example. The solar eclipse on Monday happened at about 3.28 or 3.26 Eastern time. People weren't going to wait till noon the next day or 5.30 p.m. that day. However, the engagement with CP24 online and on YouTube were was at a record high. Never before have Canadians engaged with us to such a degree because we broke the story, covered the story as it happened. That's how we're delivering more news. We're investing in news. We're just doing it oh, differently. The way consumers are engaging. Come on, give me a break. You're, you're bringing numbers like you've lost $185 million for Bell Media. It's $300 million invested in okay. news every year. Let me say this then. 
How much are you spending on American program? You've just said in committee you spend $1.7 million on content. What is that content? Is it American football? Is it NFL? Is it... I can go through American programming here. Uh, Bob Hartz, do you want The Amazing Race, The Masked Singer, The Connors, The Voice, The Good Doctor, The Rookie? 1.7 million in content, in content, you said. How much of that is American programming that you're putting on CTV stations in prime time from 7 to 10? Give me the number. You said you invest $1.7 million. Bell Media, what are you spending on American program? Thank you. It's 1.7 billion that we invest, and, and the investments that we make in uh, in a U.S. program or a foreign programming generate significant advertising revenue that we can then use to fund programming, Canadian programming like Sullivan's Crossing, Sight Unseen, Children Ruin Everything, Acting Good, Little Bird, The Trades, Late Bloomer, Shortsy, Letter Kenny, uh, Mr. Burbank, Amazing Race Canada, Highway news? Through Hell. Timber how about Kite, investing Rose in Battle, local Canada, news? Why am Slaycation, I down to one hour? Thunder Bay. Can you invest oh. in local news? Why do we have we, no news now in Saskatoon? I got one hour. Why was Vancouver cut back? Why was Calgary? Why was Edmonton? You're investing all right. You're investing in American program. Take some of that $1.7 billion and put it in newsrooms in Canadian uh, cities in this country. That's what people want. CTV built up a loyal audience. You have destroyed it since you came CEO in January of 2020. I am so happy I left Bell Media and CTV when I did in 2015, because when you arrived on the scene, you've been a disgrace, and Bell Media has not been the same since then. We, uh, I want to thank Hi. I want to thank the honourable member for significant contributions to CTV over over the decades. Uh, it's it's acknowledged and appreciated, and we deliver news twenty thousand hours of local news to Canadians every year, and twenty five thousand uh, hours of news on CP twenty four, BNN, and uh, CTV I have one hour now of channel. local news a day. One hour. Right. So a total of five hours in Saskatoon of live coverage from 6 to and, 7 and, all week. Thank you. And, and I'm sorry I'd, we've I'd gone well over time here. Thank Madam you. Madam Chair, may I have one more quick one? I um, just encourage well, all the honourable members to engage with the CTV News app where there's news at all times of the day. You, thank you. Bibic, I think the question that Mr. War was asking was clear. He talks about local news. Not everyone can go streaming. Not everyone. A lot of people with low incomes cannot afford to go streaming. They have to depend on the television. He asked a simple question, and I think you gave him the answer. Thank you. I'm going to go to the Liberals now. Um, Ms. Ganey. Anna Ganey, for five minutes, please, Anna. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. I didn't get a chance to do a, an audio test with the translators at the beginning, so please just flag if there's a problem with uh, my headset. Um, I'd like to thank the, the witnesses for, for being here today. Uh, if you could clarify for me, I think I heard earlier, um, Mr. Bivik, that the union was uh, comfortable with or in agreement with or on side with your uh, cuts uh, or the reorganization, as you've called it. Is that, did I hear that correctly? That, that's correct. We uh, discussed the process that we would use with our unionized uh, employees, and that process was endorsed by, uh, by Unifor. I, I can unpack that for you, but I'm mindful of time. Yeah, well, I, I'm just curious because we did, I think it was referenced earlier as well, receive a letter from uh, Unifor outlining, you know, quite a different position on their, on this situation. Um, there was a rally held in Ottawa on March 19th. Uh, the workers took to the streets. Uh, they had a very clear message that seemed to be quite uh, in opposition to the job cuts. Um, so c can you maybe yeah. rep, like clarify this? Yeah, with with uh, with pleasure. Thank you for, uh, for to the honourable member for the for the question. So we had. I'll start with you know eight about eight hundred uh, unionized positions were uh, were were um, removed from the Bell workforce and sixty. One percent of uh, of those affected employees actually took a voluntary separation package. So they said, "If you know, we, we are willing to go," um, and so that's an important factor here. As it relates to the union process, we had ten days of meetings over five weeks with union representatives to present the initiatives uh, that we would undertake. We obtained the union's uh, consent to offer the voluntary separation packages, um, which the the majority of unionized employees took. Uh, 
Um, we also, before proceeding with uh, the uh, initiative on March 20th, we conducted a three-hour meeting with the union uh, leadership to explain the pro process which, by which we would uh, engage with the employees. Unifor didn't raise any concerns, and uh, you know we did those uh, meetings by video. Uh, because most of the employees affected were working from home as well and through uh, various were in various parts of um, of the country and that was fully communicated to employees now regardless of which process we followed like clearly you know these have an you know important impact on the individuals affected and we tr we were very sensitive to that Okay, so then how how do you explain the the letter and the correspondence from the union uh, to the entire committee uh, from the national president with respect to their view of of the of the cuts and uh... I we have uh, you'd have to ask I can't speak for for Unifor okay. um, we well, have it's quite nine, a long letter you know, if Unifor, I had more yeah, if I had more time, I would read it all into the letter for you, but it's it's quite an extensive um, piece I'm, of I'm sharing I'm sharing the facts with the committee because you know the facts are are important. You know, we we wanted to treat the unionized employees with uh, with uh, with care. We have nine, you know, Unifor itself indicates we have nineteen thousand unionized employees, so they're an important part of our workforce. We've actually grown the unionized membership as a, on the communication side, of hiring more field technicians, which are high paying jobs, because we've invested so much in building fiber internet, and consumers are buying the service because it's world leading technology and we have a massive lead over cable. So cons consumers come, which means we need more field technicians to go connect the customer to our great network. And that's in created a 14% increase in union membership. So we're investing in that workforce. Okay, thank you. Um, back to the the impact uh, on Canadians with respect to the consolidation. In in June 2023, you had announced that you were moving to a single newsroom across all your media brands. Have you completed this transition? Yeah, we're in the process. We we we're all quite a ways, quite a long way down that that path. And the objective is to be able to deliver more news. So the viewer comes first, try to deliver more news over all the platforms that the consumers engage in. So in order to be able to make that work, we've had to become more efficient in many areas. And one is, you know, sharing infrastructure across news teams, uh, sharing okay. resources behind the camera. And a third one is, is you know, hiring multi-skilled journalists who can file stories, whether or not it's on digital, on f at six o'clock, at 11 o'clock, on, 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 any, on any of our networks. So that's how we've gotten more efficient to deliver more news. Where is that newsroom located? Located. Oh, we have newsrooms in, in multiple cities. Oh, so you haven't completed moving to a single oh, newsroom. It sounds like no, you no, were going to no. close newsrooms in order to have one major newsroom. No, that's not that's not what you we're, haven't we're, closed we're, any we're, newsrooms. No, we're 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 you know, uh, streamlining the number of newsrooms we have and not, and make sure that, that, you know, journalists, for example, aren't dedicated to one show at one particular time of day. So now we have journalists who, you know, cover news as it happens and, 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 and follow stories with whatever show it is, if it's on television or on any digital platform that's the most relevant for so that how do you, story. I'm sorry, we're, the, the time is short the with these questions. Is, the time I'm, is up, Anna. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Now, we have 20 minutes to go before 5.30, and I'm making a suggestion that we go with five for the Conservatives, five minutes for the um, Liberals, and 2.5, 2.5, so we can—that's 20 minutes, and we can end up this meeting. Now, I don't know if Bez will start before that, but let's go with that right now. So for the Conservatives, I have—sorry, um, Rachel Thomas. Sorry. Point of order? You said that we don't know if the bells are going to ring. They're probably going to start in a, in a few minutes. I want to be sure that... I'm sorry. Ouais, For whatever reason, I've lost volume. Okay. It's good to make sure that uh, the volume is working. I just wanted to say that the bells are likely going to start ringing during this uh, last round, and I just want to be sure that all parties are in agreement that we continue till the end of the meeting, even though the bells ring, so that everybody can have their turn. We can do that. It'll be a 30-minute bell, so we could have everyone agreeing to add on an extra 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. So, Ms. Thomas, and you are sharing with Mr. Good. 
Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, Mr. Pipic, I'm curious. Do you do you support Bill C-11? That's the Online News Act. No, C-11 is the Online Streaming Act. Correct. Bill C-11 is yeah. the Online Streaming Act. Yeah, we did. Uh, we did support. Uh, the the act in the sense that it was a a good step towards um you know fixing um the broader issues but it's only one step and far more is required and do you support bill c18 the online news act um uh, yes and again that's just one step in a in, in, but more of a broader discussion is required in terms of leveling the playing field as between the Canadian broadcasters and the major internet platforms who derive so much revenue from Canadian consumers without contributing back to the ecosystem. So Bill C-11 uh, was created by the current government uh, to stifle innovation and creativity. Um, it shuts down YouTubers or digital first creators. Um, and it very much puts more money in the pockets of traditional broadcasters such as Bell Media. Uh, so it's no wonder then why you would support this bill, because of course it stifles competition um, and very much acts in your favor. What's interesting though is that again, uh, Bell is an incredibly profitable company and already taking hundreds of millions of dollars from this government and yet still stands with its hands out for more for more and takes absolutely, you know, no, makes no qualms out of the fact that uh, creativity and innovation in this country is being stifled. And yet, interestingly enough, one of the talking points that you keep returning to is that this is one of the big problems in this country is that creativity and innovation and productivity are being stifled. Um, but you're actually a part of that problem by supporting Bill C-11. You're a part of stifling that. Uh, you're a part of holding us back from going into the future and instead insisting that a broadcasting act, which is incredibly antiquated in nature, is applied to the Internet. So with all due respect, you are a part of the problem. Uh, and it is for the sake of selfishness. It is for the sake of lining pockets with more money uh, that you want to be handed over based on the creative content that is being generated by these digital first creators and put out there. You want them to take 30% of their revenue and put it toward your antiquated model. I, I find that alarming. I, I find that very um, concerning that Bell is functioning in that matter while receiving hundreds of millions of dollars that's, from the government. Uh, I would say that's a pretty major mischaracterization of our position. Bell Media is in full transformation from being a traditional broadcaster to a digital media company. That would be the first point. And secondly, very quickly, I, I always very, very surprised um, with positions that would so evidently favor Disney's and the Netflix's and the Amazon's and the Apple's Mr. of the Bivik. world against good Canadian Mr. companies Bivik. that employ tens of thousands of Canadians. So, I mean, that's I'll, where I'll just, I'll just my position with this. is. You, you stated yourself, you stated yourself, people don't want cable packages anymore. They want access to online streaming. Bill C-11 pulls people back from the future into an antiquated past. It's terrible legislation. I'm passing my time on to my colleague. Mr. Gourd. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Monsieur... Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Bivic, Bivic, you used the same strategy in Quebec. Over a thousand jobs were cut regionally, and same for regional radio stations. All of these jobs, all of these people who lost their jobs, don't understand that Bell is still making enormous profits, and yet they still pay the price randomly because. People feel like they have paid the price so that others might get good dividends. Were you receiving pressure by the board, by shareholders, by large shareholders? Quebec is an extremely important market for Bell. I was born in Montreal. I grew up on the South Shore in Audible. 
We're continuing to invest in the province. You're not answering the question. We're investing in telecommunication and content and news. You haven't responded to the question, did you receive pressure? Because currently it is employees that are paying the price for helping sh shareholders. We are trying to be more efficient. I'm here on this. On this L'état de l'économie au Canada on a, Can, Canada's economy is struggling. We all need to adjust. It's not only at Bell, it's all industries in Canada. We need to become more efficient to better serve Canadians. To move to, um, I'm giving people a lot of leeway to go over time here. Thank you. So I'm going to go now to Mr. New Mohammed for five minutes, please, to live. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Bivich, you can be um, faulted for many things, but I don't think your support for C11 or C18 can be counted among those things. I think. You talked about the importance of the transition that you're making to a digital company, and I think part of the work that we're doing as a government is to support that. But the work that our government is doing and support the support that we have given to news media across this country is not intended is not intended for you uh, to pay further uh, uh, to pay further benefits to your shareholders and to your senior executives. Uh, Mr. Bivich, do you know who uh, Scott Roberts is? No, I do not. Scott Roberts is a Jack Webster winner and a two-time Edward Murrow Award-winning journalist that used to do the news in Vancouver. He was laid off uh, under your regime. Uh, do you know who Paul, Mer Paul Workman is? Uh, I don't know him personally, but I know who he is. Okay. Uh, do you know that he no longer works for CTV? Uh, that's correct. And, uh, Joyce Napier? Do you know who Joyce Napier is? Uh, yes. And you know that she also was laid off by CTV? I believe so. Yeah. Do you know who Danielle Hamamjian is? Yes. Uh, do you know what happened to her and the entirety of your London bureau? Yeah, the, um, the London foreign news bureaus were closed last year, which is an uncommon. CBS just shut down their Tokyo News Bureau after 60 years plus. Um, and that just gives you an example that, you know, the media ecosystem and news in particular and conventional broadcasting, no matter which country we're talking about, is under immense so, stress. So how do, you, how do you plan to report the news from a G7 capital like London to Canadians without having reporters on the ground? Well, we'll we, in many cases, we'll use independent journalists or we'll send our own journalists to the locality where, as news happens. It's no different than, as an example, we would, we would send our correspondents from the London office to cover um, the war in Ukraine, and now we would send somebody from Toronto. Somebody's traveling in any case. So how long would it take, let's say news was breaking, um, at 10 Downing, how long would it take CTV from the moment that you find out there was a crisis happening in the UK uh, or the, un God forbid, the untimely death of a monarch? How long would it take for CTV to be able to report from the ground with I, one of your I'm reporters? Not, uh, I'm not sure it would be a shock to anybody to say that it's extremely expensive to cover news like that all around the world. And when CBS, a company like CBS, has to shut down a long-standing long news bureau. I don't think it should be a surprise that but, a Mr. Bibich, Canadian company CBS will shut down their doesn't go news to the bureaus. U.S. government with their handouts saying, help us. You do that to the federal government, and we help you. Because we believe in ensuring that there is a strong news ecosystem in this country. No, all we're asking for is a level regulatory playing field against Netflix. And you have that. You now have that Disney through Plus. legislation that you no. have supported. My question to you is: no, Not at all, because you, those companies don't contribute to the Canadian you, ecosystem in any manner, shape, or form. You came. In terms you of came before. Content production. You, you came before government, and you said we're going to take a forty million dollar hit in our newsroom. The response was to give you a $40 million break. Uh, that's not how it transpired, actually. That's not how the, it transpired, the, but it the, is... No, it's not at okay. all how it transpired. Okay. We, we, already, we, already we already produce, we already air uh, significantly more news so, than well, the tell me, but you, you keep minimum. saying you air the, significantly the, more news. I come from Vancouver, okay? Mm -hmm. 
your footprint for news in Vancouver is, to put it charitably, a shell of its former self. You eliminated 1,300 positions on Vancouver Island. Over the course of time, I mean, these are not insignificant we, impacts. We never to would have had thirteen hundred Bell Media well, employees. Uh, okay, Vancouver then perhaps Island. your own reporting yeah, is incorrect. Bell Media, because, Bell Media has five thousand. Sorry, excuse people. me, excuse me. You've, you, okay, I apologize. The number is not correct. You've laid off people in significant numbers in communities on Vancouver Island, in Vancouver, in small communities, in large communities. How do you reasonably explain to Canadians? I mean, I'm asking you because this is an opportunity for you to explain to Canadians. How you justify taking large bonuses, paying well-paid ex- executives, at the same time as you are telling Canadians, thank you so much for the help that you provide us, we're going to lay off the journalists that provide news from your communities. And don't tell me that, well, because we're going to be able to use independent journalists here, there, and ever. How do you create viable opportunity for real journalists to be in the field doing the jobs that they do from small communities, like the ones that Mr. Waugh described? Well, we should we should create a level regulatory playing field where the foreign web giants who draw so much from Canada are required to contribute, including to the production of news, but to, to Canadian content. And we should have major advertisers like the federal government devoting more of their advertising budget to Canadian broadcasters. How much of your also think how, of how much of your enterprise like, how much of your enterprise is now digital? Tax deductibility of advertising. How, how much uh, of your business is now digital, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Mr. New Mohammed, we've Run out of time, okay. over time, actually. It's, it's getting close to 40% of revenues. Uh, I now go to Mr. Shampoo for two and a half minutes, and then Ms. Ashton for two and a half minutes. Uh, Mr. Bibic, earlier I asked you a question with a lengthy preamble, but I'll try to be shorter. I'll try to be more brief this time, and I'll come to some responses that you gave me. So, given that the government will be investing more in ads, and that should help. And given that web giants will have to contribute more to make everything fair, and given that broadcasters are asking for some relief or some adaptation, we know that making news is not something that makes a lot of money, but it is so essential to the fabric of Canada, and it's especially important in Quebec. We're talking about the identity of the regions that is being threatened by removing local news. And so if the market were leveled out and if things were fair for everyone, knowing that news is not something that earns a lot of, that gets a lot of money, could you invest Elsewhere, Mr. Bibich, can you reassure Quebecers and Canadians that once all of the current issues with the crisis have been solved, you will be reinvesting in regional newsrooms in Quebec and Canada and continue to cover remote regions? Can you commit to that today? Thank you for the question. Unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't give you a concrete answer, but we would want to continue to invest and continue to create news as we do now. And we invest in Quebec, we've increased the size of our newsroom, and so that's a concrete example of our goodwill. However, we need to level the playing field. Mr. Bibich, you seem to be responding to our questions the same way that the federal government responds to questions from the opposition. I know that you're investing in information. I'm saying that the regions are particularly impacted by this. Local news, neighborhood news is essential, and I'm asking you for a simple commitment given, or rather if, the playing field were level, if tech giants were investing and everyone has to submit to the same rules, would you commit to investing further in newsrooms? I believe I would want to do more. It would help us to do more. But... For two and a half minutes, thank you. 
When Canadians heard you were coming to Parliament, Mr. Bibic, we got flooded with messages. Among them, I received a heartbreaking letter uh, from someone whose parents lost their jobs with the company Bell recently bought. After working there for over 30 years, in their 50s, and their financial security has been ripped apart. The young person wrote, My parents' work supported the company's growth for years, and now they've been left with not even a minimum settlement package required by law to allow us to secure our house and our finances. Now we are faced with financial uncertainty. I will have to delay my studies to help my family until my parents find a secure position. I hope that you will take Bell to task on their unethical business practices. We live in fear, uncertainty, and anxiety, while Bell gives shareholders increased dividends on profits. Mr. Bibic, this is the human cost of your decision. This is what a real crisis looks like. This young person is watching you today. What's your message to him? Thank you uh, for that. I mean, that, that example is, is just shows how for the individuals directly affected, it's, it's very difficult. And uh, I acknowledge their parents' contribution to, to Bell and to the, uh, the company they worked for before that became part of the Bell family and, and thank them for that. And I, I recognize that, you know, when you're directly affected, there is no good process. What I will say, however, is that uh, in terms of the separation package what, offer... What about the packages that they're entitled legal, to that no, they haven't received? Uh, I'm sure doubt, that every, your words ring package, hollow without the severance... No let alone no, the fire. We, we, would, we would be in compliance with uh, all, uh, all legal requirements as it relates to the uh, separation packages. I'm not sure that this was from the most recent round of, of uh, layoffs, but uh, um, it appears that that is not the case, uh, as if, uh, um, regardless, uh, it, uh, it seems that Bell, see, uh, Bell did well, not live uh, up to, uh, um, to its obligations, including in terms of, of the buyout. Uh, uh, I would say regardless, because if that's just, the case, I, I, I would move. want to fix it. So if, if that could be shared with the clerk Bibich, so that it could come um, to me so that I can Mr. look into Bibich, it. No, no, it's please, a very serious issue. Please, Mr. Bibbit. Thank you. Um, Ms. 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 Uh, Ms. Ashton has the floor. She did not finish, and you cut her off. Continue, Ms. Ashton. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam uh, Chair. I, um, I, I just want to turn to how Canadians are getting ripped off by your company. Uh, we know that uh, you, you uh, um, uh, for example, we know in terms of cell phone service, um, to put it into perspective, scrolling Instagram in France, for example, for five minutes costs about half a cent. But here in Canada, it costs 20 cents. Canadians are getting screwed. And this has everything to do with the oligopoly that you and the other two major telecoms comms are running in our country. Why do Canadians have to pay some of the highest cell phone rates as you sit back gaining millions of dollars off the backs of Canadian consumers and Canadian workers? Thank you. I would, I would ask the honourable member to provide to the clerk uh, the, the, the case before of, uh, of the separation package because if, uh, if we weren't in compliance with requirements, uh, we will look into it. It's a very important. Every individual who departed needs to have their, uh, their legal separation package. And if that yeah, got we, missed, we, we heard this. It. Back to the cell phone. My time is limited. Um, why, are you, why are you ripping Canadians off when it comes to cell phone uh, costs? We're providing phenomenal service on world-leading networks at prices that are declining significantly. And I'd encourage Sorry, all committee members to look at the uh, Indu committee transcript from March 18th, where all the facts are laid out, and they're fairly, they're very compelling. The Canadians are being well, ripped you. off. Thank the you. Time is up, and I'm. The Canadians have... are obtaining yes, significant service and value. Thank you. Point of order, Mr. Wall. Well, it's not, a, uh, it's not a point of order, Madam Chair. I'm just wondering, uh, we have not had bells yet. Is there a chance, uh, you, if we could get unanimous consent, to have maybe one more round, two minutes each, for the Liberals, the Conservatives, Bloc, and NDP? Okay, um, without speaking to each other, I would like to, make, to repeat Mr. Wall's suggestion that we, bells have just started, uh, Kevin. You still think we could do another 10 minutes with, you say, two minutes each for each group? I think All we right, could. that will give us 10 minutes. We can. Is there an agreement for 10 minutes extra? Yes. All right, everybody seems in, in agreement, so we're going to have two minutes for each party, starting with the Conservatives. Yes, Mr. Giovanni. Two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Bibich, I think you've made clear to us today that you are not very concerned about the allegations of tokenism, racism, sexism, and ageism made against Bell Media. You've also made clear in your attempts to plug the CTV News app 
during your testimony here today that you want to make light of this and you don't want to take this very seriously. So what I'd like to say is that we have heard, I'm sure this is from all parties present in this process, a lot of concern from our constituents that by being customers of your internet services, your highly priced cell phone services, that they are financing a media operation that has shown a callous disregard for Canadian workers despite receiving $40 million in regulatory relief from this Liberal government, and also that we have seen uh, an, an attitude uh, of discrimination toward employees. So what would you say to consumers who are concerned that they are financing a uh, highly questionable media operation by engaging with your cell services and your internet services? Unfortunately, uh, Chair, <laughs> the, the last part of the question actually broke as the... Uh, well, that's convenient for off. you to pretend you couldn't hear what I'm saying. Oh, that's, that's um, because uh, you're, uh, again, you're being evasive, Madam Chair, and you're going to offer another word salad. Please repeat the last sentence, Mr. Javad. Ma Madam Chair, I've the, come the question here in is very clear, Mr. Bivet. Actually, I'm speaking, not you, sir. I'm speaking, not you, sir. Challenging my integrity. I am speaking. Is sorry, I am Respect sorry. our democracy, order, Mr. Bivet. Order both, Mr. Bivet and Mr. Giovanni. Mr. Giovanni was repeating his question because you said you hadn't heard it. Let me just get back to to some order here. Mr. Giovanni, repeat your question. Yes. We've stopped the clock. Go ahead, Mr. Bibbage. Thank Bibich. you. The question is for our many constituents across Canada who are concerned that by purchasing your cell services and your internet services, they are financing a highly questionable media company that has shown callous disregard for Canadian workers and an insensitivity to many allegations of discrimination. What do you have to say to those Canadians concerned about financing Bell Media? Madam Chair, I have deep respect for Parliament and for the committee's work, and I would never pretend not to hear a question if I'd heard it. And that I take issue with, and I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, it's, you know, if I say something, it's because I mean it. Now, earlier, the Honourable Member asked me about uh, diversity and the importance of it, and I gave a considered answer. It's a very important issue, and we are proud of the journey. Are you evading the regard, question again after pretending you didn't very, hear it, and I repeated it, and you're still not answering it, Mr. Bibich? We're very proud of the services we provide to Canadians who subscribe. Millions of customers are with us, and we deliver excellent value to them. Uh, we have gone over time there, so I'm now going to go to um, Mr. Coteau for, for two minutes, please, Mr. Coteau. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, um, you know, I want to start by saying, um, you know, uh, sir, you mentioned that, you know, Bell is a good Canadian company and that you focus on the client. The client is the focus. You know, is this very parliament that established your company over, what, 150 years ago? And I would estimate that billions of dollars have been invested by Canadians into Bell. Not only have they invested money, they've given you um, uh, special treatment for monopolies in certain areas. They've uh, contributed to your success, helping to develop the spectrum, uh, helping to uh, invest in your company to continue to build. You have an obligation, I believe, to Canadians uh, to do what's best for them. So when a company is making $2.3 billion in profit and they are removing um, the very fabric of our, of our news uh, system in this country, it is a, um, you know, it's a bit hard for Canadians to accept considering the, um, the investments. You, know, you said earlier that, you know, Unifor was on board with this process and, um, you know, I was uh, I was really uh, disturbed when I read um, a, a news report uh, that quoted Unifor saying that uh, this was a very shameful act by Bell to uh, to hand over pink slips for many years of devotion by uh, your uh, workforce. Um, and in fact, um, Christopher Corsi, your human resources and labor relations manager, held a 10 minute meeting. Uh, to basically fire 400 people online using Zoom. You know, if you're not going to have, um, if you're not going to, um, you know, uh, protect uh, Canadian workers and your, uh, your workforce, then at least respect them. And when I read that you actually uh, took that course of action to fire 400 people online together 
without even allowing them to ask questions. And this was coming from Unifor. I've I've, I've read the uh, the the article. Um, to me, that is shameful. Canadians have invested in your company, and they continue to invest in your company. Uh, and this very parliament established your company. And I think I we think you could I think time, you, as Mr. a company Cooper? could have done things better. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bibich. A very quick answer. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Chair. Having group video meetings with employees who are found themselves in similar situations and similar uh, positions allowed us to communicate key information to them all at the same time. And while not a perfect uh, process, it, the benefit was it allowed all employees to find out at the same time. So then we didn't have a situation where one individual found out, the first individual found out first, and the last individual would find out hours or days later, and then would have the anxiety of not knowing what was happening other than through the rumor mill. Thank you, and Mr. And that's Bibich. where we all, okay, thank, thank you. you. I'm going to go now to Martin Champou. Martin, two minutes. Merci, uh, Monsieur. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Bibich, the new president stated that diversity at Bell is important, and that's great. He stated that he would like for 50% of programs be created by black, indigenous, uh, visible minor uh, people from visible minority groups. I also agree with fairness, or equity rather. Instead of having quotas, and you're used to quotas at Bell, I'm sure, for francophone content, for example, but would it not be better to state that you are a company that gives the means to all communities, including the underrepresented communities, to be part of the creation process, the purchase of content process, instead of giving ratios or rates that could cause discrimination in an area where the number of creators from those communities might not reach that 50%, for example, would that not be a better approach to propose means to make processes more accessible? Thank you for the question. We work closely with independent producers, and this allows us to broadcast high quality series like Les Simples, Chouchou, Entre Deux Draps. There's a long list of shows and we can do this because we work with Canadian producers throughout the country, including in Quebec, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, I now, oh my goodness, Martin, you have three seconds. It's okay, all right, it's okay. Nikki, two minutes, please. Just looking at today's committee, the disconnect uh, that we've heard from uh, from Bell is staggering. A company worth $40 billion, a CEO who last year made $13 million, who at the same time agreed to laying off thousands of workers, 6,000 jobs over an eight-month period, has gutted local news, shut down 45 radio stations, left major centers and smaller centers in our country without the local news that they deserve. In a province like mine, the telecom side of things, we've seen costs go up and service go down. And across the country, Canadian customers are paying some of the highest cell phone rates in the world. How much is enough? How much profit is enough? How much CEO paybacks and profits are enough? How much dividends are enough? This didn't just happen. Bell's approach to, to uh, a, a business approach has left Canadians worse off. And it is part of an oligopoly cheerleaded on by liberals and conservatives over the years that has sought to make greater and greater profits at the expense of workers, Canadians, across the board. What we heard today, right, from the... Uh, of uh, the, the desire to shut down why we hadn't heard from Bell when we should have heard from Bell, to the fact that uh, it took forever to find out exactly what notice you gave to the federal government. I should note we've since heard that Unifor only found out on February 8th that those layoffs were supposed were about to happen. That's not respect. 
That's not a company that values the workers that work for them. And certainly the cost that Canadians are paying shows that this isn't a company that values what Canadians give to them either. Canadian workers deserve better. First Nations, rural and northern communities like the ones I represent and those across the country that work with Bell deserve better. Canadians who, des who deserve local news told to them by the people based in their communities deserve better. Thank you, Ms. Ashton. Please wrap up. We hope that Bell Media will change course, will rehire workers they've laid off, will reinvest in local broadcasting, will bring down the rates that Canadians deserve. Canadians deserve better, period. I now would like to thank the witnesses for being here, and I'm going to adjourn the meeting because we have to go to a vote, and that's why I've been hurrying you along in the last couple of minutes here, because we must vote. So thank you very much to the witnesses. Uh, it was a, a tough a tough meeting, but uh, thank everyone, and I now move to adjourn. Thank you.